A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they... And I felt... I, felt right. I was so And I just happy. thought, well... I had figured it well, out. It was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to The Story Collider, where true personal stories about science help us to discover how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today's episode is all about how we define ourselves. You know, like as a scientist, or someone who is smart, or someone who is really good at math, not me, and what happens when we don't want that identity anymore, or it no longer applies. And while it may seem silly to care about identity, research shows us that it is anything but... A well-defined sense of self is crucial for mental well-being, social connection, and effective decision-making. So when you don't have that identity, you have what scientists might like to call an identity crisis? Like our first storyteller, Fernando Cuevas. Fernando is a theoretical mathematician by degree and an analytical engineer by profession. His story is recorded at one of our local New York spots, Pier 57 in Hudson River Park, and is so relatable to anyone who felt a bit lost or stuck and thought, oh God, this can't be the rest of my life. Yeah, I think we've all had that moment. And if you haven't, well, that's probably still coming. And if you're kind of in that moment of your life right now, well, all I can say is Fernando's story is a great inspiration for getting out of it. This story is so good. Here's Fernando. So years ago, I used to work as a Geek Squad consultation agent at Best Buy in Flushing. I was proudly underachieving after dropping out of college. Um, growing up, I, wasn't, I was always told that I was the smart person in school and so by my family. And so I never felt like I had to work hard a day in my life. And when I went to college with that mentality, I failed every single class and I had to get a job. So I applied at Best Buy. And initially, I went into the job with an exit strategy where I would just make enough money to pay back my outstanding debt and then get the hell out. And so I approached this interview essentially the way that I approach everything else in my life. I just winged it. And the manager walked into the interview and the first question that he asked, he asked me what the resolution of a 4K TV was in 2015 when they first came out and my rebuttal was uh it depends because some 4k tvs are cropped and some are true 4k and he looked at me and he said oh and he was impressed and so that's what got me the job at home theater as a sales associate and initially i was a bit of a wallflower but i was promoted from department to department and eventually i found my way to geek squad and this job to me was more than just a job. To me, this was my way of like, essentially finding my way around a degree. This was my way of thumbing my nose at everybody who spent a lot of time in academia and ended up falling into debt. And so this was my way out. This was, all I had to do was get the Geek Squad, become manager. I'd make six figures immediately and I'd never have to worry about what I did or if I made the right decision to leave school. And this, idea was completely and absolutely wrong. Um, I found out very quickly that when you work at Geek Squad, all you do is you do warranty repairs, you will occasionally fix the iPhone, and then you'll get yelled at by your leadership and your customers. And so the job itself was incredibly monotonous. Um, the job itself was incredibly underappreciated. And I didn't really know what to do at the time. I found myself thinking I'm trapped and I didn't have a choice to leave or not. I felt like because my Geek Squad team needed me at the time, I had no choice but to stay. And things quickly got worse from there. Um, I was very sad, I was very depressed. I was working with people that didn't like me. I was working with people that were using me. And eventually I asked myself, what am I doing with my life? After a while, um, I was working in this Best Buy for about two years. And eventually I asked myself, what am I gonna do in two or three years 
am I just going to be working as a manager? And one day, the manager, Ken, decided to have a meeting with everybody. And he said he, it was a pep rally, a pep talk before a Sunday, because working in retail, you need to have that. You need someone to tell you, hey, come on a Sunday. And so he decided to give us his story. And I was shocked because he, it went a little something like this. He said, I used to be a student like some of you in this Best Buy store. And I was an engineer at NYU on my last year. And one day I got the job here at Best Buy and I decided to make this my career instead. And that could be one of you one day. And I guess he meant that in like an inspirational way. <laughs> but I, I, I was laughing on the inside and then out of nowhere, Gerard, a friend of mine, leans to me and he goes, yeah, that's not gonna be me. And I laughed because I was like, oh yeah, that's not gonna be me either. And then I took a second and I thought about the choices that brought me to this. And that's when things started to snowball. I started to realize that I made the wrong decision. And from there, things just got worse. Um, I was sad. My family saw that I was sad. My friends saw that I was becoming a different person. They saw that I was this guy who would talk to people about like the classes that I was taking when I wasn't taking any classes. I would talk to people about how much I was working at Geek Squad, 39 hours. And I would talk to people about gaming and staying up late until 2 a.m. playing video games. But I was stuck in the superposition of these career paths that just didn't exist. And my family saw this and my friends saw this and they all started to pull back. And I knew that I was royally messing up my life. And I knew that this reality check would come and it would hit me hard, but to me, in the moment, it didn't really matter because as long as it wasn't coming today or it wasn't coming tomorrow, I'd be okay and I'd be able to keep the facade going. And over the course of time, people started to see through the cracks and they started to see who I really was and I couldn't hide it anymore. Um, after a while, I started to go back to my old exit strategy. I just needed to make enough money to get the hell out and I could quit Best Buy and I could be free. But the question was, how was I going to make this money? It was $4,000 and I was working paycheck to paycheck. There's no way that I could tell my parents because then they'd know that I'm a failure. So my birthday was right around the corner and I was getting ready to leave Best Buy anyways. So I knew that if I didn't get enough money for my birthday, I could just, I don't know, find a different way to make money. The plan was only just to take a laptop and at that point, take the laptop and sell it. No one would know, no one would get hurt, victimless crime. But that was the moment where I was caught for stealing. I was arrested and I was fired from my dream job at Best Buy on my birthday. So it took some time to think about how badly I messed up and it's been a while since I thought about it. And I can't tell you what I was feeling at the time, but I can tell you what I was thinking. I was really frustrated that I was working long hours, 39 hours in some stolen time. And I was doing this at a store that didn't like me. I was depressed that I had made the wrong decision in my life. And I put this time towards a retail store when I could have been putting it towards college. And finally I knew in that moment that I made the wrong decision. It was confirmed right there. And as I was being driven to bookings, I asked myself, why did I even want to work at Best Buy? And the question answered itself right there. I was always the one who was told that he was brilliant and I never had to work hard for anything in my life, but not in college. In college, to me at least, college represents like the ultimate test of like, of your intelligence. And in that moment, simply put, I just could not I could not seem stupid in front of my family. And it was a sad moment, but one thing was really clear. In that police van, being driven to bookings, there was only one thing that was true. I looked pretty fucking stupid. And so at this moment, I didn't know what to do. And then I realized If I looked dumb, 
I have to be able to at least show my family that I can change, show my family that I can make myself better. These people who trusted me to be smart, I have to make them proud. And so I immediately enrolled back into John Jay. That was my first move. And taking my first classes was easy. In fact, it, after my workplace fiasco, it was the easiest thing because right after that, keeping your nose in a book for some time is the easiest thing. And so I it went right back to my classes. I somehow made a new nuclear group of friends. I minored in psych just for fun. And then I realized that I was adjusting to my new normal. And then I walked into Professor Graf's class and everything changed drastically. In walks this guy, he shuffles past all of the students in a three-piece suit and he erases the board of notes that were there and he lets everybody know that he's outlining the syllabus and that if you failed this class, you would have to take it again and everybody who was a math or science major was taking that class. And he warned everybody, not everybody was going to pass and most of the people in that class had already taken calculus already. So they were ridiculously pissed. But me, I was an idiot who's never taken pre-calc at the time, so I didn't know what I was walking into. And so at that moment, I didn't really care what happened throughout the class. I was going to go through it, and I was going to find my way. And when he handed the first homework, and it was proofs by induction, I looked at this, and I was like, I don't know what this is, but all right. And I, we went to the assessment test, and I got a 12. And at that moment, I was like, OK, this seems like it's going to be a hard class. And then I noticed the next week, a bunch of people dropped the class, about half the people dropped the class. But to me, I didn't really care because I was treating college like a video game at that point. And this loss that happened in the first two weeks of class, this was just the, like that moment in a video game where a boss walks in in the first level and he crushes you because that's what he's supposed to do. And in that moment, I realized that it doesn't matter if you fail, because failure doesn't mean that you lost. Sometimes failure can be the most important mechanic of the game as long as you learn. And so as time went on and as the class moved forward, I, my curiosity started to be piqued by this professor. And one day he just mentioned superposition and quantum mechanics in a Calc 1 class. And I was like, who is this guy? And who could he possibly be teaching in this CUNY school? And I did what any student at the time who wanted to stalk their professor did. I went to rate my professor. And I found that he wasn't just some professor. He was the director of the math and science resource department at John Jay, which meant that he was the head of everything science and math at John Jay. And on top of that, he had a PhD from NYU Courant, which is the foremost school for applied mathematics in the world. What the fuck was I doing in his calculus class? <laughs> How the hell was I going to pass? I, I looked there staring at the computer screen and I was like, there's no way I'm going to pass this. I might as well start dropping. And I opened up the tab to apply to drop the class and I hesitated. And I realized I had been always been running away from my problems all my life. But for the first time, I didn't want to. And dropping this class would have meant nothing to me at the time. But I didn't want to drop the class because for the first time ever, the professor was finally getting interesting. And I knew that at one point, I would have to figure out what I was going to do in my future. But that wasn't going to come until a long time from now. So I could just focus on this. And so as the class went on, he asked me, hey, how do you think you're doing in the class? And I said, I think I'm doing pretty badly. And he said, just focus on doing better. And that's what I did. I just focused on getting that grade up from a 12 to thir a 13 to a 30 and so on. And he noticed it. And after a while, he saw that I was doing good in the class and he asked me if I wanted to switch my major. And initially I was like, no, why would I do that? I'm doing the speed run of college. This is super important for me. I, I don't want to take a detour into math and then be screwed because like I did with Best Buy. And then he handed me the curriculum for applied mathematics at John Jay. 
And I realized that he was going to be teaching the, every single one of the classes in that curriculum. And in that moment, I asked him what he saw, and he said that he saw a student that was willing to work hard. And at that moment, I realized that this professor was challenging me. He was trying to see what I could do because at one point in my life, I guess he saw that people assumed that I was this intelligent person, but I was never tested. And that's when I realized that this professor was someone special because he, he was the one who was constantly challenging me and he wasn't treating me like I was stupid. And when I saw that he was teaching all the classes in the curriculum, I realized that this was the path that I was supposed to be on my entire life. And somehow after being lost in this world of retail, I had found my way. And so that same day I switched my majors and from that moment on, it, the rest was history. It was all just a matter of time. Um, I quickly breezed through all of the, the classes. I, they got progressively easier. And before I could even realize it, I was graduating from John Jay with a degree in applied mathematics and uh, cryptography and data science. And before you could even say COVID pandemic, I ended up working at a data science company and they specialize in geographic retail data. But the biggest kick in the, for lack of a better word, testicles, was that the, the number one, well, one of our number one clients just so happened to be Best Buy. <laughs> and that's when I was like, <sighs> but I took a second to think about it and I realized that life has this funny way of forcing you down a path that you really always been fighting your entire life. And sometimes if you're lucky enough and if you just let go and let yourself become the person that you've always been meant to be, you'll find yourself where you least expected on a path forward. Thank you. That was Fernando. To learn more about him, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Being a storyteller on stage is just one way to make story clatter happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, maybe becoming a story clatter donor might be more your speed. Story clatter donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story clatter is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power these stories have and this mission, please donate to the Story Clutter at storyclutter.org slash donate. The most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storyclutter.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Clutter. Our next story is from McMaster Professor and Lipodystrophy Canada Director Sonia Real. Her story is recorded at our go-to spot in Toronto, Burdock Brewery. And her story is unlike any story you'll have ever heard. It's intense, moving, heartbreaking, and inspiring all at the same time. I love this story so much. And it's just a suggestion, but maybe have a box of tissues nearby. Here's Sonia. Let's see, if I'm going to tell you a story, I should tell you how, you know, most stories start, right? Once upon a time, there were two little girls from Montreal, myself, and my elder sister, Liv. We were very close, especially uh, around, you know, the age of five, our mother died, and we stuck together like glue. We did everything together. We played together, we slept together, we danced together. Heck, we even got sick together. I was about seven, she was about, can't do my math right now, she was about 12. And we're starting to experience, you know, those typical diabetic symptoms, we're peeing throughout the night, we're really thirsty all the time, and we're always tired. Um, we go to the doctors and they not only find out that we have diabetes at such a young age, and type two at that, but that we're in advanced metabolic disease. So my sister and I are tossed from one specialist to the next, to the next, to the next, without any answers. They're totally baffled, right? We're like the two zebras in like a room of horses. Um, 
It's a few years after when finally an endocrinologist goes and refers us over to medical genetics um, at the Montreal Children's Hospital. I clearly remember it's like a, a doctor's room like any other. Um, there's these like faded strawberry shortcake and He-Man stickers on the wall. And the doctor walks in and he has like the whitest coat. It's like almost fluorescent. And he has this face that I think has never smiled before. Um, a, few uh, a few medical residents as well. They come straggling in behind him, you know, to see the two freaks of nature. Um, and, uh, you know, my memory is hazy about that day, but there's a few things that are very clear with me. One, firmly, firmly grasping my sister's really, really sweaty hand. Um, my father dissociated on a chair, like, right next to me, like, totally out of it. And the word lipodystrophy being said around the room like it was the word of the day. Um, it took a few months, you know, our DNA was analyzed, it was sent to labs, and um, yeah, it took about a few months to get the official diagnosis. I'm 14, Livy is about 19, and we are now officially diagnosed with familial partial lipodystrophy. The geneticist basically starts explaining to us what this is. It's an advanced, very rare metabolic disorder. And it starts with basically the destruction of fat cells. So I remain skinny for life. Um, but it ends up spreading to critical organs like the heart, the kidneys, the liver, etc. There's no known cure. And there's no consensus on medical management and literature. Even more rare is the fact that this novel mutation has never been described before. So... The first thing that I remember feeling is fear. All of a sudden, I have like this out-of-body experience, right? And I see myself as if I'm already dead. It's almost like I'm grieving for a life that I haven't even yet lived. And I'm already thinking about the things I've lost, like having a big family with kids, having a long, successful career, having a long life even. Um, so basically the doctor says, listen, this is a new mutation. We know nothing about it. We'd love to analyze you further. And well, what does that mean? That means more blood draws, more scans, more ultrasounds, more medical photography to show everything that's abnormal in a very already insecure teenager. But I say yes. I say yes, because science is the only thing that makes sense to me at that time. In the depth of like fear and all the unknown, science was my salvation. It still is. Oh my God, that makes me sound so nerdy, but it's so <laughs> true. Um, truly is my only salvation. So I agreed to help um, the geneticist. And so I debut in the scientific community, not as an author, but as a patient in a scientific clinical study, um, showing the scientific global community what a freak I was. Luckily, 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 my sister's sweaty hand never left, never lost its grip. We were together throughout. Basically, we go through all of our blood draws together, we go through everything together, because we essentially are one. I think what the mo biggest thing was, was I felt like a freak, right? But so was she. I honestly thought maybe we can make it in the circus, you know, all the pageantry, the lights, but it was nothing like that at all. We both got really sick, um, other than the loss of fat, type 2 diabetes, we got hyperlipidemia, lipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia, high blood pressure, dangerous heart rhythms. I'm probably missing a few. We were put on drugs, taken off drugs, side effects galore. The lack of fat made our muscles so painful it was hard to walk. We were basically two girls limping towards this unknown future with the blood work of basically 80-year-olds. 
I take you to about when Liv is about 30 years old. She uh, has this really dangerous heart rhythm and they put in a pacemaker. And you know, the follow-ups with specialists, they, they figure out that she's actually an advanced congestive heart failure. Um, they also find out that, yeah, her kidneys are shutting down. So yeah, dialysis for the rest of your life. Um, she gets pretty weak from, you know, being sick all the time. There's these ICU admissions, really scary ICU admissions where I'm like, I'm going to lose her. Um, but I don't. And basically she gets her dialysis and we're living together at this time, right? And so I make this, and, and now she's so weak that she needs oxygen to breathe and a wheelchair. So I make this makeshift ramp, this very dangerous makeshift ramp out of my basement apartment to take her to dialysis three times a week. I go to my lab, because you know at this time I'm doing my master's. Um, I'm actually writing the comps to transfer to a PhD in medical sciences, you know, because I love feeling at science and low-key masochist. Um, so yeah, like I would set up my PCR, anybody done PCR, it's horrible. Um, I, I set up a PCR reaction at 9.30 AM and I'd wheel her into her dialysis. And this was our routine for a couple of years, right? Um, we'd come back home, we would have dinner, I'd make her her favorite sandwich, turkey and pesto. And then we'd watch really cheesy Bollywood movies till we fell asleep. And she started to feel better and the doctor cleared her for travel. We go to Montreal, we go visit back and eat all the poutine we can. We go to this Calgary Stampede, you know, to check out the hot cowboys. <laughs> um, we get her wheelchair pimped out with SpongeBob stickers and we're just regulars at the mall, right? And it's her 35th birthday, we have this huge birthday bash and she actually gets off her wheelchair, she dances, and then she serenaded us with some really awful, awful singing. Um, she's gone the morning after. I find her body dead, cold and stiff. She's gone. The paramedics, like the 911 people, keep saying, put and do CPR on her. I'm like, she's gone. But I keep doing it anyways. The one thing I remember from that morning is I was so angry. I'm literally shaking her violently. And the only thing that keeps coming up in my head is why the heck did you have to leave me alone? Why the heck did you leave me alone? We had a death pact. We were gonna go out together. Why did you do this to me? The next 30 minutes or so, everything's kind of like, a haze, but I end up, you know, signing off papers, autopsy options for her, organ donation. And then for the last time, I kiss her feet and I say goodbye. This time I am now all alone and I have no idea who I am. But now I have a lot of free time on my hands. And I get to those horrible, horrible experiments I was procrastinating for my PhD. So I end up doing all those mouse experiments, those DNA analysis, um, intravital microscopy, you know, because I promised her. I said, I'm going to get that PhD. I'm going to get it. But it wasn't easy. Um, I myself, my, my health started to decline exponentially. Um, in 2015, I have a stroke that literally blows out my sight in my left side, sorry, this side. Um, a few days later from that stroke, I have a major heart attack. Um, they insert a defibrillator into my chest just to make sure I don't die. So now I'm kind of immortal, yay. Um, but yeah, like things were getting a lot worse. And so it wasn't easy. And, and it seemed like every time I was looking in the mirror, I wasn't seeing me, I was seeing my sister. And I was seeing her demise looking right back at me. And that scared me so, so much. I finally earned my PhD. Like, oh my God, it took me way too long. Um, this is in 2016. And I decide to move to New York City. 
um, to do a two-year postdoctoral fellowship. It was so much fun. Um, and I'm desperate, right? You know, I, I, I'm really struggling and I'm desperate and I'm looking for connection. And there's this little Facebook group for, um, it's called Lipodystrophy United. And I start randomly, you know, messaging people on there and I get to meet somebody um, in New York. Even though it's a very rare disease, the U.S. because of the population has some patients there. So I get to meet this person. First of all, we look identical. The very, what lipodystrophy does is it gets rid of your fat on your body, but it gives you this really nice double chin that we both had. And then like we had these like muscular arms and legs and we were kind of both kind of like limping and fumbling. I'm like, this is, this is me. And we were supposed to meet for 30 minutes and it becomes like a three hour conversation of, we had the same damn fears. We'd lost loved ones to the disease. And we had this like existential dread that death was just around the corner. So that was a changing experience for me and it just kept getting better. I kept meeting more people from Lipodystrophy United and I started building my community. Um, I eventually became scientific advisor for the US led advocacy group and finally started my own in Canada. The first, that was the first time in my life that I finally didn't feel alone. I could let go of her grip, my sister's grip, and I took that lipodystrophy community and I did not feel alone anymore. So in summary, I'm very grateful that I've outlived my mother and my sister, but I am very well aware of my fragility. So I'm, you know, I'm telling you a story, right? So I'm not going to say I lived happily ever after, right? Um, I think the best sort of ending I can come up with is that I lived with the support of everyone that loves me and that made all the difference. Thank you. Wow. Wasn't Sonia's story incredible? If you'd like to learn more about her or lipodystrophy, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Clatter, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use them all. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storyclutter.org to become a financial supporter. Or if you want to come to one of our shows, start your own Story Clutter show in your community, or even learn how to tell your own science story, you can learn all about that on our website too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Jen Chen and Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Clutter. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Zach Stovall, Christine Williams, Sarah Mazuri, and me. Special thanks goes out to Story Clatter's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Branson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost, and next week we're focusing on female anatomy. To be more specific, both of our stories are strictly about vaginas. They're funny and incredibly fascinating, and I can't wait for y'all to hear them. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>